Good morning, folks. 2018, multiple choice, higher chemistry. Let's have a look through what the answers um, are. Uh, see if I'm making any mistakes. Uh, and you might learn from my mistakes, hopefully. Enthalpy change is defined as the difference in enthalpy from where you start to where you finish. Um, so here's where you start, here's where you finished. However, they've got reverse in bold here. So we're starting here and we're ending here. Nothing to do with this. This is a complete red herring. That's for the activation energy up here. Enthalpy change is reactants and products. So we're starting effectively at 15, going to 40, which is a drop of minus 10. Um, the relative rate, let's get this on the screen, hey, pretend to be professional, there we go. Relative rate of a reaction which reached completion in 1 minute 40 seconds. Relative rate uh, has nothing on the top line. There's simply one on the top line over time. Uh, 1 minute 40 seconds, I would probably turn that into seconds, which becomes 1 over 100, of course, 60 plus 40, which is A. Complete with the correct unit, seconds to the minus 1. Where does that unit look? Number 3. Which of the following is correct interpretation of the above energy distribution diagram for reactions the temperature drops from T2 to Two T1. So we start here and we're moving to here. And the activation energy here. So the activation energy doesn't change. This is a fixed line. It's effectively a fixed number on this axis here. So this remains the same. So we can scrub these two answers. What happens to the number of successful collisions? In our case, we're cooling things down. So at the start, we've got all these collisions. And afterwards, we've only got these. So the number of successful collisions will decrease. So we're on to D. Number four. The table shows the first three ionization energies of aluminium. Using this information, what is the enthalpy change for the following reaction? I... Oh, that's sneaky. We're not starting at aluminium atoms. We're starting at aluminium one plus. I don't know if you can make that out. I hope you can in the video. One plus going to 3 plus. So we're only stripping off two electrons. And the two electrons we're stripping off are the second and the third. So what we'll do is sum these two together um, and we come up with, well, I'm going to take a stab in the dark and say it's probably C, but that's why I have a calculator. 18, 17 plus 27, 45 gives us 45, 62, which is indeed C. Number 5. The element contains covalent bonding and London dispersion forces. This element could be, well, if it's got covalent bonding, I would instantly throw out B because it's a group 8 element. I would also throw out C because it's a metal. Covalent bonding exists inside sulfur molecules. Sulfur molecules exist as little rings of eight, which I'm not about to draw because I'm not going to waste your time. Go back and look at my elements video. And then it's held to the next door neighbor, S8, by London dispersion forces. So I'm going to go with D on that one. Boron is a giant covalent network, so the whole thing is locked together by covalent bonding. So that's why I'm going to throw out A. Number six. Erythrose is a chemical that's known to kill cancer cells. The two functional groups present are, well, I'm seeing hydroxyl groups and I'm seeing a carbonyl group. So I'm going to go with C. I'm trying to trick you there with carboxyl, but it's not OH, it's just an H. Number seven. The name of the above compound. Right. So it's, it's, an, it's a carboxylic. They've drawn it this way just to help things, haven't they? I'd be tempted to redraw a more familiar way. This is your exam, so don't be afraid to take charge and draw stuff on the paper. I'd be more inclined to draw a more familiar way. There's a CH3 here. There's a CH3 here. There's a CH3 here. And a, you can't draw one more up there because it's the same as adding another carbon to the chain. That's a sneaky one. That's a sneaky one, but I've seen the SQA pull that one before, so that's the entire structure. So basically it is, in fact, a butanoic acid, my least favourite chemical. And we number from this end because it's nearest the functional group. 
So I think we're going to have 2,2,3-trimethylbutanoic acid, which is A. Which of the following is an isomer of pentan 3 all? Five carbons. Can we use that as a shortcut? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. No, we can't. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, they've all got five carbons. So much for that suggestion. Um, one, two, well, that is pentan three all. So I'd throw that one out. This one looks suspiciously good, except, of course, there's CH and CH there, which means there's actually a double bond along the line. So we could throw that one out. This one here also has a double bond in the line. This one here, I'm hoping that's the right answer, otherwise I've got it wrong. So let's draw it C, C, H with a branch on there, and then C, H, 2, and another C, H, 2, and then R, O, H. So, yeah, there's our isomer. Pentanthriol. Number nine, oxidation of 4-methylpentan-2-ol to the corresponding ketone results in the alcohol. You could draw this out if you fancy. 4-methylpentan-2-ol, um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 pentan, and then there's an OH on here, pentan-2-ol, and a methyl on there. And if we convert it to a ketone, then we rip this hydrogen off, and we rip this hydrogen off, and we create a double bond. So we have lost two hydrogen atoms, which is the equivalent of uh, two grams per mole. So 9A, because each hydrogen atom has got a GFM of one. Are we still on screen? Yes, we are. Essential amino acids, very simple, KU time. That's the stuff you have to eat because you can't make them in your body. So humans must acquire through their diet. If it was my exam, I'd just come back and check that the rest are wrong, but I'm not going to burn your time doing that today. Number 11. A mixture of carbon dioxide and hydrogen can be converted into water and a mixture of hydrocarbons. Okay. This used to be called synthesis gas. What is the general formula of the hydrocarbons produced? Hmm. Is it looking like a maths question? How would I tackle this? There's probably a way to do this mathematically for all you maths genii out there, but personally, I'm inclined to put something like just n equals 2 into this equation and see what pops out. So if we have 2CO plus, that would be 5H2, that would give you 2H2Os. And now we can work out what the formula would be. Um, we'd need to have C2, because there's two carbons here, and there were 10 hydrogens on this side. And four of them are used up in the water, which leaves six left behind. So C2H6, which is an alkane, so the answer is D. I think that's how I'd solve that one. If anybody can suggest a maths way to do it, feel free to leave a comment um, showing how thick I'm being on this one. A mixture of sodium chloride and sodium sulfate is known to contain 0.6 moles of chlorides, 0.2 moles of sulfates. This is an old chestnut. Um, let's have a look at this. Sodium chloride is Na1Cl1. You'll see why that's important in a second. And sodium sulfate is Na2SO4-1. Now, what that means is for every one sodium chloride, you have one sodium and one chloride. For every one sodium sulfate, you have two sodiums and one sulfate. So what we can do is we can work backwards to figure out how much we've actually got here. There's 0.6 moles of chlorides, which means that number there must be 0 0.6, because there's every one of these for one of these. Two moles of sulfate ions, again, that number there must be 0 0.2, because the multiplier here is just one. So how many moles of sodium ions? Well, we've got 0 0.4 moles of sodium from here, plus 0 0.6 gives us one mole of sodium ions. Sorry, make rustly noises in the background. Number 13, 
under the same conditions of temperature and pressure, which of the following gases would occupy the largest volume, i.e., which has the most number of moles? Because for gases, number of moles is directly proportional to the volume. So I'd convert these into moles. Uh, it might be the easiest way, using mass over GFM. Do watch for diatomics. Watch for your Hoff Brinkles, uh, guys, because... Remembering hydrogen is actually 2 in this case. So we're talking about 0.2 over 2, which is going to be 0 0.1. My mental arithmetic is correct. 0 0.44 of carbon dioxide. I'm going to cheat here because I know fine that carbon dioxide's GFM is 44. So it's 0 0.44 over 44, which, if my mental arithmetic is correct, is a hundredth of a mole. Definitely not that one. Just check that on the calculator. Yep. 0 0.6 grams of neon. 0.6 over 4, isn't it? Oh, no, Neon's 10, I think. Yeah, Neon's 10. Uh, no, 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 no. Try again, hey? Neon is 20. Silly old fool. That's why we don't guess. 0.6 over 20. That's not going to be much, is it? It's going to be 0 0.03. And lastly, 0 0.8 of Argon. I'm not going to guess, even guess this time. I'm just going to look it up. Argon is 40. Should have known that. And that's 0 0.02. So, in fact, uh, A is the answer. It's the largest, isn't it? It's not the smallest. Yes, the largest volume. Because it's the largest number of moles. Number 14. Which volume of gas would be obtained by the reaction of 100 centimetres cubed of ammonia gas and excess copper 2 oxide? So we don't care about the copper oxide. It's excess, which is nice. What volume of gas would be made? Atmospheric pressure. Oh, 20 Celsius. Lovely. So if we look at their products here, we're interested in the products, guys. Um, there is going to be no excess ammonia, so all of that 100 is going to get burned up. So we're only interested in the products, none of the reactants. And that is a solid, so solids volume is negligible. And at 20 Celsius, that is a liquid, so therefore that volume is also negligible, which leaves us with just nitrogen gas. So what I would do is I would look at the ratios here. 2 makes 1, so if we burn 100 of this, we're going to make 50. Centimeters cubed. There you go. That's a nice, easy answer. Doesn't tell you the molar volume. You don't need the molar volume. I do love gases for that reason. Number 15 is just on the screen. Yes, it is. The addition of which of the following substances would move the equilibrium to the right? A famous question. Because at first glance, none of these four answers will seem to be involved. Well, actually, three of them will be involved, but it will go the wrong way. And the other one apparently isn't involved at first. Let's have a look. If you add hydrogen here, I don't see hydrogen at all in this equilibrium. Oh, okay. Here's me jumping to conclusions. Maybe it's not. The same as they normally do. If you add hydrogen chloride, then you're going to add hydrogen ions, because that's hydrochloric acid. So you can add both of these. These are present on this side. If you add to this side, it drives the equilibrium to the left, which is the wrong way. So that is wrong. Um, sodium chloride, again, will add chloride ions. So again, this side, wrong. Sodium hydroxide. Oh, I see what they've done, just for a change. They've got two answers that don't, at first glance, seem to be involved. But if you think about this for a second, are we still on screen? Yes, we are. Sodium hydroxide, NaOH, will add hydroxide ions. Now, hydroxide ions will react with one of these. In fact, they will team up with the hydrogen ions and they will run off hand in hand to the sunset as water molecules, which will effectively remove something from this side of the equilibrium and that will drive the equilibrium to the right. So D, in fact, is the correct answer. Hydrogen is, interestingly, I fully expected them to have something like sodium hypochlorite. So NaClO minus, again, you're adding to the wrong side. But it's wrong anyway, it doesn't react with anything. Number 16, when 3.6 grams of butanol was burned, 124 kilojoules of energy was released. What is the entropy of combustion of butanol? The definition of the entropy of combustion, folks, is burning one mole. We did not burn one mole, but we have got a mass that we have burned, so we can scale that up to pretend we burned one mole, and boom, out will pop the answer for you. Butanol, they haven't given the formula. That's fine, we can work it out. So that is butanol, C4H6. 
eight seven eight H eight O. Um, so my two columns approach here would be mass and energy. Don't know why I've done one in lowercase and one in uppercase, because I'm a Muppet, that's why. 3.6 grams releases 124 kilojoules. That's what the question tells us. We want an energy released when we burn one mole, so this is a mass, so what we'll need to do is find the mass of one mole of this, which is 4 twelves are 48, plus 8 is 56, plus another 16 is 66, plus 6 is 72. Let me just check that, because in an exam, we double check it in a calculator. 72. So we need 72 grams here. And um, <clears throat> depending on how good you are at maths, you might be able to see what the multiplier is here, or you can do my cross-multiplication method, or you can do whatever method you like. We're doing proportional here, basically, guys, and we want to fill in the answer. A quick sanity check here. Uh, if 3.6 gives 124, then 36 would give 1,000. Sorry, would give 1,240. In fact, it's double it, isn't it? Which is two no bit thousand. So that would be my sanity check. 72 times 124 um, over 3.6 gives us around 2,480, which is 2480. Are we done? Sort of, because there's two answers. Now, entropy of combustion is always exothermic, so it's actually C. What a sneaky question. I like that one. 17. Consider the pathways shown below. Let us take 10 minutes out of an exam to consider the pathways. Let's not. According to Hess's law, the enthalpy change for reaction X. So we're going from here to here. So we're going round the houses this way. You notice we're going with this arrow, but against that arrow. And I've just drawn over the numbers. Nice one, hey? So it will be negative 394, and then we need to flip that. So we'll add positive 283. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's going to be minus 111, isn't it? So the answer is going to be B. Um, 18. Which of the following could be used to oxidize? I need a data book for this. Excuse me. Okay, we need uh, the boa and the bra. The, the best reducing agents uh, are the ones that love themselves to lose electrons. They love to be oxidized. So the best reducing agents are up here. In the top right, so the bra is up here in the top right, and the boa best oxidizing agents are down here in the bottom left. And the electrons go that way. How does that help us? Let me keep this on screen on the question. Can we do both? Probably not. Which of the following could be used to oxidize sulfite ions to sulfate ions? So we're changing from SO3 to SO4. <clears throat> so we need to find... Uh, we need to find this on the table. Let me take a second or so to think about this one. Yeah, this one's doing my brain in as well. Um, sulfite and sulfate. There we go. There. Oh, no, sorry, that's thiosulfate. There we go. SO3. So... We start with SO3 and we're moving to... Ah, gotcha. Okay, so we're starting with this. So the electrons, I said earlier on, electrons go this way which means we need something on this side and below SO3. Does that help us? Aluminium 3 plus diff iron, three, iron, sorry, two seconds. Chromium 3 plus, stop making assumptions, hey. Should have brought your specs. Nope, aluminium 3 plus, definitely nope. That's a way up here somewhere. Iron 3 plus, I'm seeing that there. And SN4 plus, SN4 plus is above uh -huh, it's on the correct side, but it's above. Uh, we need something, yeah, this line and below. So it's going to be iron 3 plus. There we go. That went wrong footed me there for a second. Sneaky question. During a redox reaction, nitrate ions are converted to nitrogen monoxide. Never seen this one before. Even I've never seen this one before. That means I'm going to have to do the hard job and build it all up. Stage one, balance the non-oxygen element, which is nitrogen. Stage two, balance the oxygens by adding water. We will need two waters on this side. 
to give us three oxygens. Stage three, balance the hydrogens on this side with hydrogen ions. And stage four, add electrons so the total charge is identical. Four plus and one minus makes three plus on this side. So we would need, and there's nothing on this side. Um, so we're going to need to add three electrons to this side. There we go. Uh, reactants products? Oh, I see. Oh, all right, right, right. Gotcha. So for products, we need to add two waters to this side, which and there's only one option. So I'm hoping that, yep, I've done my maths correctly. The answer is B. Well, I'll say that. We'll find out when we do some marking. 20, last question. Which line on the table correctly identifies the changes that will cause the greatest increase? Another equilibrium question. That's weird. Why have they stuffed a random equilibrium question at the end? They must be desperate for a mark. Okay, delta H is negative 106 kilojoules. And that is from left to right, which means going this way is exothermic. They want the greatest increase in the solid. So we are trying to drive the equi equilibrium, if I can say it correctly, to the right. That's what we want. Moved to the right. Brilliant. So in this case, we want actually a reduced temperature. So it's a lower temperature. So we can scratch these two. And if you have a look at the moles of gas you find that there is one mole of gas on the left and there are zero moles on the right. Which means if we... Now, I always have to remember this. I think I got this one wrong in a previous question, uh, a previous year. If you increase the pressure, the equilibrium will move to the side with the lowest number of moles of gas. So in this case, we want a high pressure, which is B. Uh, okay, marking time. As I said, I didn't cheat. Thanks for listening. If I come back to you, then you'll realise that I've made a mistake somewhere. Otherwise, thanks for listening. Bye-bye.